All right, we'll get started. This is the study guide. This is the test, right? In the same order. There will be three questions on the exam broken into a couple pieces. This is it. Um, what questions can you have? What can I clarify? Yeah. Let's start with sketching microstructures then. So to sketch a microstructure from a phase diagram, we need a phase diagram. Let's do the one from class uh, that we were talking about today. Let's go to our phase diagrams and talk about steel. We'll do steel briefly and then we'll do a precipitate as well. So we'll do that one next. Uh, first, let's pull up the phase diagram for steel. Drop it over here. Okay, so if you're going to sketch the microstructure, we need to have a composition. So with steel, you're typically talking about over here, this range between 0 0.002 and 0 0.76. These are hypoid detectoid, or you're talking about something hyper um, So hyper detectoid. So let's assume that we're at, I don't know, let's call it 0.5, which is right around here. Let's sketch that microstructure and how it evolves as you cool it down. So if you were to cool down along this line, um, if you started right here and you were to draw that microstructure, you're in the pure austenite region. So you're going to have one phase, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a perfect single crystal per se. Most of the time these are polycrystals because we start to grow from a bunch of different spots. So we draw that with a bunch of grain boundaries, something like that, where each one of these is the austenite phase. And then when you cross into this two-phase region, you now start to form ferrite. It's what we call pro-eutectoid ferrite because it's forming before that reaction. So if you're just above this point right there, and we were to draw that microstructure, you'd have to use the lever rule to determine how much of each phase there is, and we could do the calculation. Let's just write it out. So if we're going to draw that structure, it's over here. To do that one, the lever rule is going to say that the amount of ferrite, which is on the left-hand side, that means that we want this section on the right divided by the total length. So it's going to be 0.76 minus 0.5, oops, that error, let me that was, divided by 0.76 minus 0.022. So let's plug that into Wolfram Alpha real fast. So it's 0 0.76 minus 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.76 minus 0 0.022. This will tell us the, this is in given a weight fraction, that phase diagram. So that means that this number, 35%, is weight fraction. Technically, if we're going to sketch that, you know, it'd be better to have the volume fraction because the volume fraction will be proportional to the area fraction. We're going to skip that because we're just ballparking it anyways. We're just doing a sketch. So 35% is going to be ferrite, the rest is going to be the other stuff. In other words, we're going to have the same grains that we had before, but now 35% of this is going to be ferrite. I don't know if that's 35%, but the idea is that everywhere along the grain boundaries before, that's now ferrite. Why grain boundaries? We talked about that a bit in class today. If you have to form another phase, you have choices. You can either form it in the middle of the old phase as a precipitate, and that means a really high surface area. Because every one of those little tiny particles has a surface area around it. Surface area thinks surface energy. That's a penalty. Or you can put it on the grain boundary, which already had a surface, right? So you're replacing an old energy surface that cost you something in terms of energy with a new one. So that's where it's going to prefer to go if it's a high enough temperature. The steel phase diagram is pretty high, right? This reaction takes place at 727 degrees Celsius. That's fairly high. So given enough time, um, well, yeah, since we're just above it, that's where this is going to want to phase segregate. If you do it fast, it, it won't, you could kinetically suppress that. So that's what it'll look like. And then when we go below the eutectoid reaction, what happens there? We cross just below that point. It turns into A into something else. What turns into what? Um, y turns into F. Yeah, our gamma phase turns into a mixture of now eutectoid ferrite and eutectoid cementite. So we're still going to have the pro-eutectoid ferrite, 
doing its kind of funky grain boundary tube things. But now everywhere else that used to be just pure gamma, that gets transformed into a mixture of, well, our lamellar structure. Does that make sense? Yeah? So let's look at one slight variation on this. Let's look at precipitates. This one we had the drawing, so we'll just take a look at it. So this is for the aluminum copper system, a great way to strengthen copper. In fact, in the early days of aviation, they had a, uh, they accidentally did this. It was a aluminum chassis and they, I don't remember why copper was introduced, but it was accidental and it strengthened it. And it strengthened it because of what we're gonna describe. So you have pure aluminum and a little bit of copper, doesn't take very much, will put you into this solid solution region. If you go too far, then you'll be, you know, you'll melt it or you'll have a two-phase region uh, at high temperatures. You don't wanna do that. You just want a little bit because you then want to cross over the boundary upon cooling and look at these temperatures, four or five hundred, that's not very hot. So if you, you don't have to necessarily quench it, but if you cool it and you cool it not at a really, really slow speed, then you're probably going to be down here before you've really started to precipitate out this, what they're calling the theta phase, which is in, this is in weight percent, that's probably a one-to-one -one aluminum and copper compound. You'd have to do the math, right? Because this is in weight fraction, not atomic fraction. But whatever that theta phase, phase is, whether it's a one-to-one -one or something else, that phase is going to start to precipitate out technically as soon as you cross this line. But in practice, it depends on the rate at which this all happens. And so you can get two different types of microstructures. If you did it really slowly and you held it at a, a, as close to this line as you could, technically below it, then the phase is going to show up on the grain boundary. That's where your theta shows up. If you do it not doing that, doing it a little bit faster, probably going to precipitate. This gives you better strength because as your material tries to, as, as a deformation needs to be material, these are essentially hindering it way more on that later this semester. But that's, that's an example of how you sketch it crossing through a retrograde solubility limit. Other, does that answer your questions? You want to see more examples? Um, you clear? What was your other question you had? Oh yeah, oh, let's do let's do that one right there while we're at it. Okay, let's do it for this one. I, I think this might be a one to one compound, but let's prove it to ourselves or disprove it. Maybe it's something else. So at fifty five weight percent, we have this. It's not quite a line compound. There's a very thin region of salt solubility. It's not very much. It's pretty close to a line compound, but there technically is a little region, and it's at about at fifty five, meaning fifty four weight percent. Let's calculate what the formula of that intermediate compound would be. If it's 54 weight percent, 54, that's weight percent of copper, therefore it's 46% uh, weight percent aluminum. The way that you always do these problems is you assume, okay, since it's in weight percent, assume 100 grams. If there's 100 grams of total material, in 100 grams, that means that there are 54 grams of copper, and that means that there are 46 grams of aluminum. So we want to convert those to moles so that we can take the molar ratio, because that's how chemical formulas exist, is in ratio of atoms, right? So to do that, we need the molecular weight of these two things. So we can pop over to our periodic table, whichever one you like. Yes, sir. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. That should say CU. Good catch. Thank you. Um, so the molecular weight of aluminum is 26.98. So there are 26.98 grams per mole. So how did we know how to divide it? I'm just looking at the units. I want my units of grams to go away. I want to turn them into moles. Therefore, I had to divide by this, right? Not multiply it. Same thing for copper. If we look at copper, I think it's 54. No, 63.55. 63.55. So we're going to divide by 63.55 grams per mole. So 54 divided by 63.55 is 0 0.849. 0 0.849. Okay. The other one is 46 divided by 26.98, so my assumption was wrong. It's not a one-to-one formula. 46 by 26, 46 divided by 26.98 is 
What's the formula of this compound? How do you know that? That's right. There's twice as many, right? You'd have to multiply this guy by two to get to that. So there's twice as many moles of aluminum. Okay. Say again. Yeah, so it's going to be CuAl2 would be the formula of that intermediate compound. That makes sense? You could do harder ones where it's not an obvious multiple of two, but pretty easily. The hardest is when they're weird ratios, like a two to three ratio. In those cases, you have to kind of scratch your head a little bit, but it's still the exact same approach. I have a question about what you did originally when you were showing us um, the A and I graphs. Once they're on this. So, one more time. Uh, the alpha and beta graphs that we're doing. Yeah, that one. So I'm really confused. So is the reason that austenite, is the reason austenite, because austenite is a compound that forms. Austenite is an active living base. Is the reason austenite forms the like rivulet and river running instead of the dashes. It's a single phase. Well, the dashes are multiple phases, right? This is the lamella structure, that's two phases. Look, this is alpha and epi-3c. Up in the austenite awesome phase, it's one phase. Then, um, and you just, but you still have the big giant holes in the carpet field. These aren't holes, those are grain boundaries. Grain boundaries sorry, you Remember when, when you start to I crystallize in different question. regions, they're oriented differently. So when they come together, there has to be some way of indicating that it doesn't match up quite. But right. the reason they form there and why you don't just end up with more cracking is because how do we even word this? Um, is because this is what they typically look like, by the way. Yeah, the reason is because you um, it has to be the temperature, right? It has to what now? So you're asking why they don't like go away? Well, no, I'm asking why it doesn't just expand more because you so. Like why these grain boundaries don't grow larger and larger? Yeah, that's what I'm at. That's they what will. Mean. That's called, well, it's grain growth, but it's called Ostwald ripening. Yeah, then why didn't they just do that immediately? Because it takes diffusion. It takes, you have to move atoms, and that's a slow process. So where's a good picture of Ostwald ripening? <laughs> we'll see this later. I mean, you don't need to know this for this chapter. We're coming back to it. But given time, like for you to get rid of those imperfections, you have to have diffusion. So it takes time and temperature. So why did they just use dashes in the first place? When you say dashes, uh, dashes are two different phases. Yeah. Uh, look at the second uh, look at the second image. Why is there this why is there dashes? Why aren't there dashes in the answer line? In the second image? Yeah. We're in a two phase region now where the original phase was lost tonight. And we started to form a secondary phase. So we have options on where it's going to go, along the grain boundary or precipitating in the middle. It's going to be lower energy to form along the grain boundaries. Because, again, if this is the grain boundary, this already costs energy. So why would I create a new boundary in the middle of pristine lattice if I just put it there? The only reason is that it takes diffusion to get to the boundary. So that's, you don't have that diffusion, it's not showing up, it's going up. One more time. Let me, I'm going to turn the microphone on because it's a little loud. Okay, the question was one more time. So, why is, why is there diffusion? Why is there diffusion? Why is diffusion able to happen in the second image but not in the third? It, it can't. It depends on the temperature which this happens at. So the last thing we talked about today, we said, we said the thickness of these stripes depends on the temperature at which that reaction happens at. And the other reaction happened at a much higher temperature. The other reaction happened above the eutectoid, right? Yeah. This one, when you cooled it down, this happens over the span of, I don't know, 50 or 100 degrees. It's slowly happening. This one happens at a single temperature. Technically, it should, like, it should immediately all transform. In the upper one, it's slowly transforming, depending on how thick this, this bar is right there. Yeah? So, what phases do we use to let the Maybe a better way, maybe another way to phrase this question is, when do we use the lever rule? What information does it give us? 
you can use the lever rule in any two phase region. You cannot use it in a single phase region. So like if you were right here, you couldn't use the lever rule because the lever rule is for multiple phases and that's just austenite. But any other two phase region, you could use it. If you were right there at where that sort of grid intersects it and you wanted to figure out how much austenite there was and how much liquid it was, great. You can use the lever rule and it will tell you how much it is. You would have to first drop tie lines down. So you would say going straight down and this is where your ruler is gonna be helpful. Try and draw that as straight as you can going down. This one over here, try and draw it as straight as you down, straight as you can. And then we know that if you wanted to figure out, say, the amount of liquid, what you want to know is this blue line divided by, say, the green line. And if you wanted the amount of austenite, it would be the, the light blue line divided by the green line. Okay? And then the other nice thing that this process gives you is it gives you the composition of the solid. Right, the austenite, it te you tells you that it's, you know, whatever that is, 1.8 or something. And it says the composition of the liquid is about 3.7. Yeah? Uh, this one is just yeah. okay. So let's, let's do an example of these first three. Galvanic series versus standard reduction. Or was there another question before phase diagrams? Before we leave phase diagrams? No, no, definitely not. Even on the same di phase diagram, for example, if we come down to it, right here. In the same phase diagram, we see an instance where, in this case, the liquid is on the right. But what if you're in this region over here? Ignore the dashed line for a minute. That, ignore that for a moment. If that was a solid line, the liquid's now on the left. So you have to look at your phase diagram and look at what phases you're on the left and right every time. It's not always going to be one way. Plus, our definition of putting iron on that side and carbon on this side is totally arbitrary. We could have switched to that. Yeah. If we're given a phase diagram and for whatever reason the lower axis is uh, like all these signs or something, could we possibly use the level one on that diagram? Absolutely. I've never seen a phase diagram where things volume percent. They probably exist. But the level would work. It would give you the answer in volume percent. And could you then, uh, could you then convert that volume percent to weight percent? Absolutely. How would you do that? So his was a good question. If you have, let's say this is in weight percent, but you want to do it in volume percent in the end. So you did your weight, you did your lever roll and you got him in, you have to, you have to convert that to volume fraction. I heard over here, you're gonna use density, right? So for example, if you knew that, well, let's, let's use these ones right here. Let's use these values. If you wanted to convert that to volume fraction instead of weight fraction, instead of doing what we did down here, which was to determine the formulas, we would do density. So we'd say 54 grams of copper and 46 grams of aluminum. We need to convert those to a volume to get the volume fraction. So we're going to need the density. So you'd look up the density of copper. Yeah, periodic tables are allowed, and they have this information. So 8.96, 8.96, that's grams per cubic centimeter. Again, I knew to divide because I'm trying to make my units cancel to be left with a volume of copper. Same thing with aluminum. We know aluminum, 2.69 grams per centimeter cubed, I think. So now we can do that real quick. Let's 54 divided by 8.96 is uh, 6.026 centimeters cubed. Uh, 26. This one is 46 divided by 2.69. Is 17.1. So now we have the volume of each phase. To get the volume of fraction, you take the volume of one of those phases divided by the sum of the two. So we'll just do it for one, let's do it for copper. We'll say that the volume fraction of copper is then going to be equal to 6.026 divided by 6.026 plus 17.1. Let's do that real quick and we'll move on.
26%, right? So even though it was almost a 50-50 mix by weight, because one is so much more dense than the other, it's a very different number by volume percent, right? It was almost one to one by weight, but it's only a quarter by volume. So copper, because it's so much more dense, you would technically, if you wanted to draw this the right way, you'd be drawing a lot less copper, about a quarter of the image instead of 50-50. Does that answer your question? Whoever asked that? Yes. Yeah. Any other phase diagrams before we move on to electrochemistry? Alex? When it comes to mineral stuff, if we're trying to ask, I guess, to find a level of certainty, where do you want to be in the weight of where it actually is on the arbitrary line? Are we actually going to estimate where the weight distance of the composition percentage would be at that point? Okay, if I understand the question, if for some reason it's not a straightforward application of the lever rule. Like, let's say you wanted to figure out a point where it's roughly half, half and half. Could you just estimate it, basically? Yeah. Uh, there's no question like that on the exam, but sure. Okay. Um, in general, in the exam, it's good practice to... I, I, you're gonna, so I, we grade he heavily with um, partial credit. So if you don't know how to do exactly every step, you can always say, I don't know how to do this step, but if I did, here's what I would do afterwards. And you'll get all the points that come afterwards. Even if you make up numbers, be like... I don't, I can't remember how to do the lever roll. Let's assume that I had a 50-50 weight fraction in both phases and then finish the problem. We'll grade the rest of it as if those numbers were correct. Like we'll give you as much extra credit, not extra credit, partial credit as possible. Because I really want to know if you understand the approach more than can you do the calculations. Doing the calculations, yes, is part of it. And you'll get, part, you'll get points for that. But the steps and the process is equally important. So you'll see that on the homework I, I, I run the, the test. I will release a rubric for every problem. And you'll see how exactly the points got broken down. Most of it is by knowing steps. Not not just the math, right? Yeah. So if the phase comes from like let's say the liquid phase, we'll okay. take the dark blue line and divide by the total. By the green. By the green. It's green. always the opposite, ten count two. But it makes sense to consider like if that dot was really close to the liquid, stands for reason you should have more liquid. Therefore the blue the dark blue line would be longer. So it's not just the same for whatever you Anywhere you put your tie on, it's always going opposite to it, is giving you, like, it's, it's the right hand length, that gives you the left hand column. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. Any other questions? I'm yeah. How, how cooling through the eutectic does what? Let's hold on to that because we're going to have a whole chapter on kinetics later. You don't need it for the exam. Yeah, we will talk a lot more about kinetics and the microstructure impact later. Yeah. Again, that's a kinetics question. We will cover later. Yeah. So, are we going to have questions of like, what does the? Um, are we going to have questions of like, what does the microstructure look here? Where you're specifically looking for like how the elements are distributed. I think. What we've talked about in this class, like this sort of thing, if you could know the reason why these different things form in these three different micro sketches, that's good enough for this class. Certainly for the midterm. It gathers on the grain boundaries. And it's not a specific reaction that's happening at one temperature. It's happening over a range of temperatures. So there's time. Should we move on to electrochemistry or more phase diagram questions? Okay, we can always come back. Let's jump ahead to phase uh, to electrochemistry. So we'll take these three questions or topics. And we'll drop them down here. Okay, galvanic series versus standard reduction potential. You guys tell me what's the difference. Nope. Nope. These can work for the same material. They can all work for the same things. But there's a fundamental difference. But in the name, standard reduction potential tells you a reduction. Galvanic is usually the reverse. It's showing you oxidation. And obviously, any of these things, you can flip it. Like if we go to our standard reduction potential table that we know and love up here, this guy, if we flipped every one of these reactions and flipped the voltages to the opposite of what they currently are, we would have a standard oxidation potential. 
right? So they're, they're equivalent, but it's important to know the difference because engineers sometimes get focused on the mechanics of what you do with these, like, oh, the one that's lower, I flip it. Well, what if I give you an oxidation potential table? What then? So the lower one it explodes? Again, the key here to not mess it up, because if you're just trying to remember like lower means flip, like you'll get it wrong. The right way to think of it is that when I combine these two things together, one as an oxidation, one as a reduction, and I add them together, I should have a positive voltage. That's spontaneous, right? Any of these, right? For example, the reason we flip the more negative one, let's say we flip the potassium, right? That gives you a really big positive number such that when you combine it with, I don't know, like nickel, that small negative number, the big positive, gives you a big positive voltage. It's spontaneous, right? But there's a reason why we say that these are spontaneously more, well, those ones are more spontaneously noble, meaning they're gonna stay as metals, and these are more likely to corrode. They're more likely to oxidize. So, yeah. I was gonna say, why wouldn't you put silver and three potassiums together just to give pure silver and put pure potassium in? Oh no. Well, no, well, no, because you want, you want big positives. So if you put ionic silver and solid and normal K together, would it like, have a huge... So silver and potassium, if we look at those, combining silver, which is right here at positive 0.8, if we were to combine that with... Sure, I, you, if you combine this one with that, you're going to combine positive 1.42 plus positive 2.92. It's just a really big positive voltage, meaning... That would be the, the most thermodynamically favorable combination that this table offers us. Meaning, will that, that reaction occur? Probably. Absolutely. Like, it will be violent in its occurrence, right? It's going to happen very, very spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The two aluminum that it wouldn't change the voltage. You don't multiply. That's the big difference between this and free energy. In free energy, if I multiplied my reaction, let's say I wanted twice as much CO2 production for whatever this reaction was, the delta G for that reaction gets multiplied by two. That does not happen here because we account for the doubling in the electrons. The voltage doesn't change, the driving force stays constant. What does change is the electrical current. If you had to have a situation where, let's say, you multiply one by two, one by three to get six electrons that is now balanced, that means that there's six electrons, that's a lot more current than just two. So you've tripled your current, but at the same electrochemical potential. So we had an example of that down here, right here. So we combined silver, which is just one electron, with aluminum, which is oxidizing by three, because that's what it wants to be, looking at the current table product of that. So to combine these, when we combine this reaction together, if you add it just regular, you have one electron on the left as a, product, as a reactant and three on the right of the product. That's not balanced. Therefore, we had to multiply the silver by three. So you see the three silver ions, the three silver metals, and we didn't write the electrons because they balanced, so we just left them off. Um, but if you look at the voltage, all we did is just add these two together. We didn't multiply the voltage and pressure. Can you just come back up to the table for a second? Sure. Yeah, question? Would you say that we should have that on our sheet here, or are we going to have to give them the The periodic table, or uh, sorry, this reduction potential. You do not need to have this on your sheet sheet, no. If I will provide the information you need to do the problem. So again, this is a standard reduction potential, but if we look at a galvanic series, If you look at a galvanic series, they're typically, not always, but typically written in terms of backwards, like they're showing you oxidation. Yeah, see, see here. It's showing you, at the top, it's showing you things like magnesium and zinc, things that oxidize really easily. The bottom is have a noble stuff, like graphite, titanium, gold, platinum, stuff down there. So, so if you were to combine these, you would not, what, if you combine titanium, say, with tin, you wouldn't flip <laughs> because this is now written as an oxidation reaction. So you flip that because if you look at the actual voltages, you want to have the most positive voltage. You These are defined the as I think defined as well. you have the most yeah. negative can you want the most negative to be spontaneous? That's free energy. 
Um, free energy is negative is good. You want to go down in energy. But again, I didn't do this, so don't blame me. Don't shoot the messenger. They've defined a positive voltage as spontaneous. I don't know why they didn't just do negative, but that's what they did. Here's how delta G is related to delta V. Depends on the number of electrons in the reaction, Faraday's constant, and a negative sign. And remember that the tables, your galvanic series or your standard reduction potential, when you combine those together, that just gives you the first term, the one under standard state conditions. But if you want a real battery, you have to take into account first of all what temperature does, the number of electrons involved, and the difference in the concentration of your oxidized species and your reduced species. So, a quick question, are you going to give us the values of stuff like Faraday's constant and no. gas constant? That's stuff that should go on your note sheet. I'll, I usually write a few on it at the top of the exam, but you should know though. I, I don't take responsibility for you knowing those. Put them on your note sheet. Yeah. So, when you're doing a calculation, both relating delta V to delta V and when you're doing like a non standard um, cell potential, for that value of N, would you have to multiply your. Um, reactants in order to get the electrons to balance out, what does N become? The number of electrons in the balanced equation. Like coming back up here to the one we just looked at. Down? Yeah, right here. In order to balance this, to have the same number of electrons as product, uh, reactants as products, we had to multiply this one by three, and then we had three electrons on each side. N would be three for this supplement. Jim? Um, so N is the number of electrons Hold up, let's I want to make sure everyone's getting a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, so one of the first questions first, but then after that, do you know if you're addressing like something that we had in MOQ where you should find you have like an equation and you should find what it's talking about to uh, reduce totally valid. I could give you a you know, maybe you have this information either as a standard reduction potential or as a galvanic series. I don't know how many times I have to hint this, right? If I gave you a galvanic series. And I said, these two things are present. Can you tell me which one gets corroded, right? Well, the way that you get it in class and on the homework is you said, oh, it's all standard reduction, easy. Take the lower one, flip it. That's the one that's getting corroded, right? Because right now, these are, none of these are getting corroded. They're all going from ions to metals. Corrosion is the other way around. Your metal turns in, it, it corrodes away, typically. That's oxidation. So it's oxidation that we're usually worried about. So to know which one gets oxidized, in this table, it's easy. You flip the lower one. In a galvanic series, it's not always like that. It might be the other way around. It depends on the way that it's written. Okay? If they're written as oxidations or reductions. So yeah, but that only tells you part of the story. That just says, given no other information about the concentrations or temperature, you have a hunch that potassium will get corroded and gold will not get corroded. But technically, there is a scenario where that's not the case. It's crazy, right? The, the numbers will be bonkers. But even if it's potassium and gold, which we said wants to react violently so, you could punch in a number. If, say, you had one mole of potassium, and you could solve for what the con sorry, one, uh, one molar, one mole per liter of potassium, you could solve for the concentration of gold that would prevent that reaction from taking place. Because this, this is a natural log, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to scale pretty wildly. Um. Yeah, go ahead. So really, can you just rapid fire off what each of the values in that are? That we should know? In this equation? Yeah, in that equation. Delta V is the thing that your battery actually outputs, right? Yeah. Delta V naught is the standard, standard condition just from the coupling of which two elements are present, right? R is gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. P is whatever the temperature is. N is the number of electrons in the balanced Redox reaction, you need you had a re reduction rea half cell, oxidation half cell. You had to combine those and make sure that the electrons are balanced. This is that number of balanced electrons. F is Faraday's constant, 96,500 coulombs per mole. Natural log of, this is the concentration, that's what the square brackets mean, concentration of your oxidized species raised to whatever the, I haven't written it here, but you have to raise it to the number of moles. Like, if we go down to our example here, the balanced equation looked like that. So these pure metals, we're calling the activities one, meaning we're going to leave them out. But dissolved ions and species, that's where we use the concentration. This had a three in front of it. 
Therefore, this is your reduced species from the bottom. It's part of the reactant. This is a reactant. So it's the concentration that's silver, but it's Q because we had a three as the coefficient in front of it. Whereas the aluminum, that is all one didn't have a coefficient, so it's just aluminum concentration to the one dollar. Okay, cool. Um, and so, so what is concentration? When you say concentration. The number of moles per liter of. So to dissolve the ion, it's some sort of ion in solution. It's the moles of that ion in the volume of solution that it's dissolved into. That's molarity. Okay. And Hold that thought. Yeah, yeah. Teddy. Uh, that equation is left with A naught. Half cell reactions. Again, we, have, we don't know anything about concentrations or temperature there. That's just sort of as written on paper from our potential table. That's what that first term is. Um, but didn't you... Nope. Oh, I think the book is does it stupid because they do like one minus the other. I think it's simpler to think, write one as an oxidation, one as a reduction, add them together. And the oxidation thing is flipped, so it's positive now. If you are using a reduction standard reduction potential table, which is what this is, these are all written as reductions. If you're going to turn one of them into an oxidation, you can do so, and you can flip the voltage. Same thing with the galvanic series. If I gave you a galvanic series, if you flip one of them to make it a reduction, because we're using written oxidation, and then you flip the number. And when they add together, if they add together to a positive number, you get it right. If they go to a negative number, you probably have it backwards. Now, there exists, we said this before, there exists a scenario where, you know, cobalt and cadmium, they're right next to each other, cobalt's a little bit lower, therefore, we would flip cobalt. But there's still a totally valid question where I could say, tell me the ratio of the concentration such that even though it's it looks like cobalt or the uh, cadmium gets oxidized, the actual cobalt is oxidized. And you're going to have to apply a voltage or, flip the, or make the con concentration such that the second term becomes larger than the first term. Again, maybe this is a positive number, but if this term becomes more negative, then the reaction goes the other way. Because the overall voltage is what matters, not just this one. Yeah? It's the number of moles of your dissolved ion divided by the total volume of your liquid that it's dissolved in the solvent. That's molarity. Yeah. Moles per liter. Sorry, that, that was my question. Just clarifying. Molarity. Yep. Yeah, mole, 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 yep. mole per liter. Sorry, we didn't talk a lot about that in that class. It's a it's from Gen Chem, so I was yeah. assuming that was rattling in there somewhere, but Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that unit because the, the capital M yep. was molarity. Yeah. Stands for yeah, anyways. The capital ones with the different metals in the redox reaction, but still, it's it, it's all molarity. Other questions about this? Is that pretty clear, ish? I hope so. Yeah. If we were given a, um, it's, if, instead of being given the delta V zero for standard state conditions, if we were instead just given a delta V at a particular temperature. Yeah, this guy. Um, or no, if it was. If we were trying to find that guy, but we were only given a delta V at a particular temperature, would we even be able to solve that? What does a delta V at a temperature mean? So if you knew, if you, if you were like, the cell potential at this temperature is plus like 1.2 volts. That's saying this. Well, no, that, that's saying this. If you give it a temperature and you're giving me a voltage, we're talking about this. Okay. This is not defined at a temperature. It's, well, it's defined at a very specific temperature. It's defined at this super specific standard state conditions, which is standard state condition means you're using a platinum electrode on that all these metals are against a platinum electrode, which has one molar hydro hydrogen ion. So you have an acid, one mole uh, present on the other solution. That's only H2 balls on the other side. And then you're doing this at one atmosphere at 25 C. That's what all of these are done. So when you say like, oh, I've got a voltage at 80 degrees, are we talking about a voltage you hooked up to platinum in one molar hydrogen? Or is it in some battery, like chromium combined with tin? So we need more information than what we just described. If it's that material connected to a platinum electrode, and the platinum electrode is in the presence of one molar hydrogen ion, then sure, you know, we could use that as the delta V naught. But that's never how it's defined. It's never defined at a temperature other than 25 degrees. That's the standard reduction standard. Yeah. Were those values you provided to us on the test? I'll provide those. You do not need to write this in your test uh, note sheet. If you want to, you can, but you don't need to. 
I'll provide that information. What's the conversion between Celsius and Kelvin? You add 273. So Kelvin, it goes to zero at zero, but Celsius can have negative numbers. So therefore, whatever your uh, Kelvin number is, you have to add 273 to get to, other way around, Celsius has to add 273 to it, to Kelvin. Other questions on this? Should we keep going? All right, looking at the uh, study guide. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when you go for the attraction repulsion, um, like, yeah. Tiger. Yep, let's do that. With these ones. So, this attraction repulsion, we like those because. Um, they allow us to explain a bunch of physical phenomenon in materials. If you think about the way that ions are attracted to one another, um, they're not only retracted though, right? If we were to plot, say, let's just do force for a moment. Plotting force against interionic separation, F versus R, we know that most materials, a good, at least a pretty good guess as to what their attraction would look like, it's going to look like this kind of 1 over R dependence. Uh, 1 over r squared, and that's because this attractive force is equal to, it's going to be the charge of the ions. In physics, they write it like this. They write q1, q2, um, they write the k in front over r squared. That's the physics way of writing Coulomb's law. In our class, we write it slightly differently. It's the same thing. We write the oxidation state, z1, z2, times the charge of an electron squared all over four pi epsilon naught r squared. It's the exact same equation. Physics does it in arbitrary amounts of charge, but for us, when we're talking about atoms and ions, they exist with integer amounts of charge. The integer amounts is like maybe you're plus one or you're plus two, hence why we put integers here and then the charge of an electron. But it's the exact same thing. The k is equal to this 1 over 4 pi upon the exact same thing. It's just a different way of writing it because we're dealing with integer amounts of charge for each end. So that's our attractive force. That's what draws things together. But things don't just come all the way together and then E and D or collapse it, right? It doesn't work like that. There's something that keeps them apart as well. What is that? Repulsion. Which is, from a mechanism standpoint, what gives rise to repulsion? Um, overlapping electron shells? Poly exclusion. Poly exclusion principle. Overlapping shells, something's coming at those two things together. Those are two halves of the right answer. How does that come together? Explain that. Yeah, they don't want to like, touch each other. They don't want to be in the same space. Yeah, they cannot okay. occupy. Like, this is like from a quantum mechanical reasoning, which we haven't tossed in. You didn't learn in Gen Chem. They just said, trust me. Yeah. Poly exclusion principle is a thing. You take PK and learn why. But they said, trust us, you, can't, you cannot occupy the same, at the same energy in the same area, the same volume of space, you can't have that. Therefore, if you are going to overlap and be in the same volume of space, it's possible, something has to go up in here. You can't, you can't both be in your lowest energy level. Something's got to occupy an energy level, and that goes up fast. It, you really have to start making really steep penalties go up to a higher unoccupied overlap. And so, therefore, when you start to, basically, until you're touching, there's basically no repulsion. But as soon as you start touching, where the cloud's volume is, is so overlapping, then you have to start promoting higher energy levels until it takes off. Yeah, in the back. And that's why you have to dip the energy versus the Yeah. Let's show you what it actually looks like. So I've shown you attractive force. Let's draw the repulsive force. The repulsive so force. That's why it'll drop as you, as you decrease R, and then it'll just infinitely shoot up. Yeah, the repulsive force is basically zero. I'm talking about that's draw that really close to zero. Then it's basically zero until you get to the point where the clouds are like overlapping or whatever that distance is. And then it's really strong. It takes off. Um, yeah, but talking about the energy, like the energy involved. Yeah, we'll get to energy in just a second. Let me redraw that one more time. So then if I were to combine these two terms together, it's going to, the, the negative overwhelms at low levels, but then eventually the positive overwhelms, and then it reaches something that looks kind of like that. That would then be our net, and our, our net force. Uh, 
Um, therefore, we get a couple interesting things from this. One is the point at which there's no net force on the ions, right? There's a force that wants to pull them together, there's a force that wants to push them apart, there's a point, a distance at which there's no, there's no net force on it. We learn about this in physics. If anything has a force on it, it's being moved, it's accelerating. If there's no force, it's staying put. So there is a point at which this bond will be stable. That's an equilibrium bond distance, okay? Uh, we also learned that technically then, because we have a expression that shows what force does as a function of interatomic separation, if you took the slope at that point, the slope is value of the tangent line at that zero force point, that slope should be proportional to the stiffness of your material, right? The Young's modulus. And if you look at, it's funny, every time I touch the laptop, my arm gets shocked and it loses its connection. There's some grounding problem in this Microsoft laptop. It's a bummer. Right, this, this slope right here tells you the delta F to achieve a certain delta R. That's, that's stiffness. How much force do you have to, to apply to something to get a little bit of change in your R? Like you're gonna, if you're gonna separate something and pull it apart, that should be that stiffness, right? This is stiffness. So all you need is a derivative of this force expression evaluated at R naught, and then technically you multiply it by one over R naught, and that is proportional to your modulus. Okay? Bunch of questions, yeah. From good question, it de it depends because attraction it's straightforward. Like in physics, we have four like laws of the universe, like gravity, you know, electrostatics, the weak and strong forces. This is different because this changes with the shape and the size of the ions. Like, let's say you're silver. What do we know about silver? If we look at our periodic table, silver is right right here. It's a one, two, three, four, five. It's an n equals five compound with four d electrons. So it's technically got five shells. We can include the five s and the forty. So it has loads of shells, like a big volume, and they're very different shapes than say oxygen. Oxygen only has one s, two s, and the two p orbitals. So its overlap is totally different because the shape and the size of its outer electron cloud is totally different. We don't have like a generic expression that works for everything. Uh, from a mechanistic standpoint. So instead what they do, they just hit it with like a mathematical expression that kind of fits it, which looks like this. It says, well, if, if the attractive force, we defined it as a positive number, let's define this as a negative. We're gonna say it's some negative B, some constant, divided by R2. It's gotta be a higher value than R squared. If R squared falls off like that, it's gotta be a higher exponent than R squared. So they typically, well, it's a tunable parameter. They call it N, but it's usually a value of six, seven, eight. And the reason that these are tunable is just to make this generic expression work for any type of elemental combination. Because some have lots of shells and some don't have very many. So they make it, they make it tunable. Yeah? Um, what's the value of epsilon naught and what's the charge of Epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 uh, farads per meter. I'm just going to assume that I don't have to worry about any epsilon naught. Uh, I wouldn't, well, Ignore units at your own oh, peril. Per meter. You said it's per meter? Farads per meter. Meters are one of the Okay. Um, yeah. So you're talking about the slope having a relation with uh, the stiffness. So the higher the slope, the higher the stiffness of the other. So. Yeah. Think about it. To achieve a certain delta R by elongating it, a really high slope okay. would mean you need a bigger force to do that. So a ceramic, a ceramic would have a really steep slope because they're stiff. A solid would have a really gentle slope. Yeah. Is the force of attraction the A over R you have in that force is like A over R minus B over R squared? I don't know if that's I remember there being like an A over The book and, and yeah. you could you could simplify this well you could complicate it further. You could say that this is equal to A over R squared. And then looking at that expression, A is just everything except for the R squared. Okay. Yeah, you do that. Um, now important to point out here. Really, really important. This attractive equation is a, is a rule of thumb. There's plenty of times where it's not followed for real materials. Like the attractive thing is just not perfectly described by Coulomb's attraction. So that can be due to shielding or many other reasons. So in those cases, A just becomes a tunable parameter. So if you calculate A and it's not the same as what you would calculate, don't freak out, right? That's okay. It's okay if it's slightly different.
Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, hold on. Question back. What would be what squared? That's the charge of an electron, 1.609 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Like, uh, this is Robert Middleton, this oil drop experiment, God bless him, uh, figured out the charge of an electron. Although he, he went on to do some kind of crappy thing. Like, uh, I think all these people did, all the humans did. Robert Oppenheimer, like the bomb guy, like the movie person. You know, when he tried, when he finished his Los Alamos work, he tried to go back to Caltech and Berkeley, which is where he'd been working before Los Alamos. Uh, Robert Oppen, uh, Robert Wilkins was now the president of Caltech, and he's like, I don't know if we should let him back. We already have a lot of Jews on the faculty. <laughs> After World War II, pretty scummy. Um, okay. Anyway. Negative 19 for E is that? E is 1.609 1. times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's epsilon. That's your permittivity of free space. 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 farads per meter. Yeah. So the net energy equation is pretty much a combination of F and F bar here. Yes. F net, shown in purple on this diagram, is simply F A plus F R. And we saw that. If you go back to our homework from this, the force expression as a function of R was just written as A over r squared minus b over r to the n. That's a generic expression for the overall you know, net force. We could write the n there if you want. It's just combining those two terms. Yeah. But again, I want to stress this, that just because you know, you're going to have to, on, on the test, you're going to have to solve for an a. If this a doesn't match, the a you're expecting Coulomb law don't panic. This means that it's more complicated than just Coulomb law put together. Wait, what? Uh, two quick things. First of all, the, I don't, do the units add up? Because so you have. Great question on the units. Units of Newton should be in four. I mean, there's a bunch of different units that are equivalent, like you could convert them, but it has to have a unit of Newton, right? Therefore, the units of A should be such that when you divide A, whatever its units are, by a length squared, you get a Newton. So, same thing over here. B, when you divide it by a length to the n power, you can get a, 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 you know, a unit of uh, a force, newtons. Well, I'm just looking at it. You're dealing with two chart. You're, you're dealing with two reduction numbers, which are constants, times um, coulombs divided by uh, mm -hmm. zero, which gets some stuff over here, and r. Yeah, let, let's calculate A, what the units would be. So if we come over to A, this has the units of, we said, integer times integer times coulomb squared. So coulombs squared, we're going to divide that by integer number epsilon, which is farads per meter. So we're going to divide that by farads, and we're going to divide that by meter. That's A. So it converts this. So you can convert that to newtons. Oops. Uh, sorry, we can't go to Newtons because we still have to divide by r squared to get that into Newtons. So one more time, divided by meter squared to Newtons. There you go. If you, if you plug in your numbers as coulombs, farad, and meters, and you divide it by your answer in meter squared, it will come out Newtons without any conversion necessary. Let's look. Yeah. A is this, if I'm not going to call it a constant, it's, a, it's an amalgam of those other things that make up Coulomb's law. And FA is your attractive force. So does FA, so FN, no it's FA, it's FN R equals A over R squared minus B. I got a little bit sloppy. All of these should be written with parentheses R technically, because these are all functions of R, but yeah. F of n, which is a function of r, just like f of r is a function of small r. All these things are functions of r, they're changing with r. Yeah? So you could set a for r squared to be just two functions of r, but if you wanted to solve it actually, right? You could plug in z1, z2, absolute value of those, multiply e squared, 
divided by four pi epsilon naught, and that is a. Okay. Big a. What I'm saying is that in the real world, when you actually use this expression to fit data, a isn't always the right value to use. Like real real materials don't obey Coulomb's law perfectly. Is what I'm saying. Because of shielding, because of things we have yet talked about, it doesn't always perfectly follow. Yeah. According to my notes, um, the the repulsive force that is speed times n over r n plus one. Is that correct? Is that force? It's force. Um, I think you're right. It's energy that doesn't have it. Uh, thank you for catching that. I think you're right. Ah, thank you so much for catching that. Let's go to energy and, and talk about where that came from, what she just mentioned. I usually start with energy. Thank you for catching this. Yeah, no, that's not subscript. That's n times b. And is n is just a random number? n is a number um, that is a fitting constant for that material system. So let's do energy because I messed that up. Thank you for catching that. Energy, we do the exact same way because energy and force are related to one another. If we go back to our diagram of this early on, we said that, oh, if you want to know energy, but you do know F, then all you need to do is take the integral of this with respect to with the, the, the distance uh, dimension along which the force is being applied. And for us, that's the R direction. So if we take the integral of our force expression, it should give us energy. Or if you have energy and you want to get force, you take the derivative. So let's figure out energy here. We have to take the integral of the function that we just did. So let's do that real quick. If that's our function for force, and we take the integral of it, our net energy is going to be the derivative. Let's take the derivative of that first term, a over r squared. When you take the, the integral of that, what is it? You're going to step it back up one, right? So it's going to go from negative 2 to negative 1 where we have a negative out in front. So it's going to be negative times a over r to the now just, just to the 1. It was negative. It was squared before. Now it's just 1. Then our second term, which was negative bn over the r to the n plus 1, that's going to go down to just r to the n. It's going to go down 1, and that n disappears. It's plus because it was r to the negative n plus 1. So the negative sign disappears. And it's just over r to the n. Thank you for catching that. Again, and we can work it the other way. If you took the derivative of this, this 1 over r becomes 1 over r squared. So negative has to come out, right? This one, if you take the derivative of that, it's 1 over, uh, well, this has to go over step up 1. And we have to bring the n out front. That's why we have n in the force expression. But it's the exact same approach. Um, and it's the same concept that there's two terms competing with one another. The resulting diagram is what we call in this class a potential energy well and has this generic shape. Again, we can technically draw like a repulsive and attractive energy, but it doesn't matter. This is the net energy one. And the lowest point on this diagram would correspond to the R naught, where our R naught was at, that's where our F net was at zero. This point right here, that is R naught, is the same point as this one where there was no net force acting on your material. So if you wanted to solve for r naught, you could do so. To solve for r naught, we would take our net energy, uh, sorry, our net force expression, set it equal to zero, and at that point, r equals r naught. Under that condition, when there's no net force, when it's at zero, well, you've solved for your r naught which is just another way of saying graphically, on this purple line, when it's zero, it's the R value. Okay. Similarly, if you wanted to know your binding energy, the binding energy written as E naught, well, E naught, you would just take your energy expression and you would plug in R naught. If you plug in R naught, that specific value of your energy, again, 
schematically from a graphical perspective, it's just saying if you know what your R naught value is, you see the point on this line where it equals that value. That's your binding condition. Okay? Yeah? So this uh, stands for the energy that holds things together? That is the energy that holds things together. Yeah, the binding energy. So when, like alumina, things that are really, really hard to break either mechanically or they're hard to dissolve, they're really binded really tightly together, we're going to have a really negative value. Like this will be really a very negative one. Alumina is a good example. Alumina is really hard to break it apart. It has like negative, you know, some big number. Um, other things like a polymer that is easy to break apart, it's not nearly as negative. It's way, way up here. It's a much more, what we call a shallow potential energy well. Alumina is aluminum oxide. Zirconia is zirconium oxide. That's just the shorthand, what people call it. Other questions? How are we doing on time? Yeah. Halfway through. How's my battery doing? That's a better question. Um, remind me again how what, what, what the energy graph of ceramics compared to polymers compared to the other one. Yeah, let's do that real quick. So let's assume that this one here is a metal. If that one's a metal and I asked you to sketch next to it what a ceramic and a polymer looks like, um, the biggest thing to note, there's two things that I'd want you to draw. One is the depth of the well should change. If you had a ceramic shown in purple, should be deeper, right? definitely should be deeper. Uh, I don't like that. Actually, let me, let me fix something real quick here. Give myself a little room. All right. So if I take my ceramic line, I'm, it's going to be deeper for sure. It's also going to be closer, right? The R naught will be less. Not necessarily. That depends on the ions. The R, it, maybe it depends. But what you can say is it'll be deeper and it'll be more symmetric. Like this is a little bit more symmetric. It's more like a perfect U shape, whereas this is more tweaked. It's more bent out. That's asymmetric. Okay. And then a polymer is going to take those exact same trends but exaggerate them the other direction. So if you take a polymer, it's going to look like this. It's much more asymmetric and it's much more shallow. So the binding distance is related to the, say like the thermal energy, the melting point. So a ceramic is a really high melting material. It's a really deep binding energy. Metals are a little bit less, polymers way less. It doesn't take much thermal energy. There's a reason why polymers all melt. Even the really good ones like Teflon still melt at like you know, a couple hundred degrees. Um, whereas ceramics are a thousand degrees and metals are in the middle. Okay? The other takeaway from this is that, well, two things. This radius of curvature is really tight. Well, what is the radius of curvature mathematically? Pi r squared? No. It's the, it's the second derivative, right? Radius of curvature, uh, let me switch to a different color. The radius of curvature is the second derivative, d squared e dr squared. Well, what was de dr? Force. So it's just you take the derivative again after force, so it's df dr, which we already said was modulus. The stiffness, right? Oh. We said if you took the, the derivative, if you took the derivative of the force expression, you got the modulus. Or in other words, if you take the derivative twice of the energy expression, that's also the modulus. Therefore, a higher modulus material should have a smaller radius of curvature. So when you sketch these things, two things. Three things are right now. It should be deeper, it's a ceramic, it's a higher binding energy, it should be more symmetric, and it should have a smaller radius of curvature. If it's a stiffer material. And by modulus, you mean the modulus elasticity? The modulus elasticity. Cool. Yeah, the stiffness. Cool. So again, the polymers, that radius of curvature is really big. That's a really big radius of curvature. That means it's a really small uh, yeah, it's stiffness. Yeah, yeah. Polymers are easy to stretch. Ceramics have super low modulus elasticity. Really high modulus elasticity. Well, high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, low, so ceramic has a low modulus. Ceramic has a high modulus. Polymer has a low modulus. Um, what if you wanted to, from this diagram, get the average bond distance as you heated it up, the thermal expansion? What would you do? Where is that shown here? Uh, I think the slope, right? Not the slope. Yeah. You uh, draw a straight line at an energy point and then you heat it point that line. 
That's right. So let's take the red one for simplicity's sake. It's at zero Kelvin. It's going to be at the bottom of its energy potential well. So it has a very specific R0 bond distance. But as you heat this thing up, you're giving it thermal energy. You're basically allowing the ions to slosh back and forth along that line. Like, they're not like fixed in space. If zero Kelvin can stop vibrating. They're allowed to vibrate. And the amount of vibration they're getting is going to be dictated by this line and the amount of energy that they have. But the point is that they're sloshing back and forth on that well. Oof, it like zaps me. So what I've drawn there is three different horizontal lines corresponding to a little bit of thermal energy, a little more, and a little bit more. And you can see that the average point is changing there. Let me get this to not zap me. The average distance between those two points is changing. It's getting bigger. The vast majority of materials get bigger. It expands when you, when you heat it up. And this, you could calculate it. How would you calculate that value? You have to plug in this value, that R value, you have to plug in this one, and you take the average point. Yeah, you can do it. What's that? Now you have enough thermal energy to dissociate those two ions, which is nothing. So if you have enough thermal energy to go all the way up to zero, you have enough energy to melt that thermal, which is what happens. Yeah? So that implies that it expands when you um... heat it. Oh, yeah, you, oh, you know, right. It's a low, it's a negative energy. You're increasing energy. Right. Yep. You're adding energy. To the Energy's going up when you heat it. You're giving it energy. Um, other questions? Yeah? Um, so, it's more symmetrical because it's deeper. It also, uh, that's just a physical alteration. Like, if you were to plot this function, the one that I'm doing, if you crack the plot, you'll see it's the more symmetrical. And the implication from a material property thing is that because it's more symmetrical, look at the same distance I did there. Let's draw it on a ceramic. So, the metal, I went up a distance of that much in thermal energy. Let's do that same thing here for a ceramic. My average distance is there. It's not really changing as much. It's changing much less. For polymer, it's way more. First off, we'd melt the polymer if we added that much. But that means that the ceramic tends to be a lower thermal expansion material. And in practice, that's what we see. The rule of thumb to remember is that a ceramic has a thermal expansion value of between 0 and 10 parts per million per Kelvin. So for every degree Kelvin you heat it up, how much does it strain? Something on the order of 0 to 10 parts per million. Not very much. A metal is on the order of 10 to 100 parts per million. Parts per million. And a polymer is typically over 100 to be three or 400. They expand like crazy. Thank you. All right. Other questions on energy force diagrams? Did we answer what it told us to study? Energy versus interatomic, force versus interatomic. Uh, we'll talk about oxidation states in a minute. Energy from a photon is important to remember. Like, you know, if you wanted to provide a photon that provided this amount of heating, what wavelength should that have? If this is the amount of heating that you want to achieve, that delta E, we'd want to we'd want to relate that to H times C divided by lambda, where H is Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, and lambda is the wavelength of that photon. They're inversely related because a smaller wavelength means a higher energy. So a green photon, like if you look like the rainbow spectrum, blue is like on the one end, red is on the other. Ultraviolet, blue is next to ultraviolet. Ultraviolet sunlight is way more dangerous. It will burn our skin than, than infrared, just on the red side. Lower wavelength, the more energy. So do that expression. Like, um, H is C is speed of light. H is what's constant. Planck's constant, which I don't remember. Let's write it out. Let's, let's look. It is 6.62607 times 10 to the negative 34 joules. You can also get it in electron volts, which might be more relevant here. In electron volt uh, times seconds, it's 4.1357 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volts times seconds. 4.1357. That's Planck's constant. Again, so therefore, if you have something that is an energy times a time, 
and you multiply this by a uh, speed, that's a length per time, you're going to be left with um, energy volts times a length. But you're dividing this by a length, so you'll be energy. Um, and what's the speed of light? 3 e to the 8th meters per second. Approximately 3. Approximately 3 e to the 8th meters per second. Yeah. Yeah. Three B on the first homework. So let's take a look at it. So the, the question said, if you're trying to melt the compound of the laser, take that entire photon energy and convert it to thermal energy, which may or may not happen. Some materials reflect photons, right? This is assuming that it's going to absorb it all. Big assumption, but still. What minimum wavelength of radiation would you need to use? So on that one, basically you're, at, you're saying, if you knew what this energy versus R expression was, how much, what should that wavelength be? Well, it has to be at least enough to come from the bottom of this energy potential well. Assuming that it started at zero Kelvin, it gets hit by a photon and now has enough energy to melt, you have to have at least this much delta E, right? So whatever this binding energy is, you have to set the photon equation equal to that binding energy. That's how we did that problem. So if you knew this value, because you knew R0 and you knew the expression E versus R, you'd plug in R0 into your energy expression, pull out E0, set that equal to HC over lambda and salt for lambda. Um, can you go over the three Yeah, which is what we did there. Um, any other questions on force versus energy diagram stuff? Yeah, I think that we covered everything. The only thing we didn't talk about yet is oxidation states. Let's just briefly talk about that. Oxidation states comes from an understanding of their periodic table, plus an understanding of how electrons like to exist. And they're kind of like people who said they don't like to pair up. They would rather have an empty shell or a totally full shell. Therefore, if you're, you know, this describes most oxidation states. There's a bunch of oddballs that it doesn't describe, which is weird ones, but most of them it describes. If you're zirconia, Zirconia is ZrO2. Oxygen is always 2 minus. There's two oxygens. That's the total of negative 4 we have to achieve. Therefore, zirconia must be a plus 4. Well, it makes sense that it's a plus 4. Look at where it is. It's right there. If it loses 1, 2, 3, 4, it's got two empty shells in its outermost shells. And it looks like, at that point, it looks like krypton, which is perfectly happy looking like a noble gas. So it would, it would like that very much. So 4 is going to be a common oxidation state for zirconium. In fact, it's the only oxidation state for zirconium. Even though zirconium, you might assume maybe it's like a plus two. For whatever reason, nature says, no, it's a plus four ion. There's nothing, at least in this database, which is Shannon's radii from the class form, where it's ever been anything other than a plus four. Yeah. Don't they sometimes want all of their half shells filled for? Yeah, full, empty, and if it can't have that, half filled. And we see evidence of that. Like, take a look at iron. Iron. It's number one, two, three, four, five, six in the D series, right? So what could it do? It could lose all six and empty out its D, and it's technically going to be a plus six ion. It could be plus three by losing one from the D and two from the four S, and then it's got an empty S and a half of D. So three is actually a pretty common oxidation state. It could become plus two, but it's losing two of those. And it's technically going to be four. I don't know what it would do to get four. Who knows what it does. But it, these rules are a pretty good way of guessing oxidation states. But there are a few oddballs in there, which just don't make sense. Other way around, something that's negatively charged, like sulfur. Sulfur could, you know, maybe it could lose its four electrons become plus four charge. And maybe it's just going to add two electrons and become two negative charge. So you can check and see what it is. Your periodic table will show you common oxidation states. Probably it's gonna, I can do both. So check it out, it's an interesting one. Compounds have been created and measured where they, it's almost always minus two, but it, you can find it with plus four where it loses those four P electrons, or even plus six, 
where it loses the four, the, the four two P electrons and the two two S electrons as well. That's also possible. I have no idea what compound that is, but it does it. Yeah. Um, I have a question going back all the way to the big diagram. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Um, are you saying like the composition is just weight driven, or are you asking for a formula like you want to help the region um, or the other? On the homework specifically, what am I asking for? I mean, we can take a look at it real quick. I want to not spend too long on this. Homework three. So I ask which question? Which, which part? So it says, your boss suggests that you use the phase diagram from ALSI, shown below. It's this one. That's the phase diagram. Um, your boss suggests to use that phase diagram and try to explain what you see in the microstructures. Measure the area fraction of the pro-eutectic phase in each microstructure using software like ImageJ. I'll give you a link. And then use this information to calculate the composition of the vendor's alloy. So we have two microstructures. This is the doped material, this is undoped. So this one should match the phase diagram if it follows thermodynamics, which is always a big, we hope so. We don't know, right? So if that's the case, when I look at this, it has some bigger globs that clearly formed when it was still solid and liquid, and then all the rest is your eutectic structure. So in image J, what you could do is you could go through and circle all these big globs and if these are big enough, it's hard to so it'll, it'll just go to use a lot of air trying to circle them. But at least get like the big ones. And that should give you an idea of what the area fraction of the pro eutectic phase was. If we then look at our phase diagram, oh, and I think it says, it says, in these micrographs, the aluminum shows up with higher brightness than silicon. So because these are dark, that's silicon. Now, the, the alloy is supposedly 13 weight percent silicon. That's what it says. Our eutectic is at 12.6, so we're over here, so a little bit to the right, which makes sense, because the dark globs are silicon, and the pro-eutectic phase is gonna form is this one, which is silicon. So what I'm asking you to do is, like, you can actually measure the area fraction of this alloy, okay? If you know what its supposed composition is, you could do the lever rule and see if the lever rule matches what you observe. And then comment. Does it match? Does it not match? Why might it not match? Is it close enough? Like what could be going on? And then the second part of the question says, okay, if you dope it with a tiny amount, like less than 0.01% of a certain type of dopant, all of a sudden your microstructure looks wildly different. It looks like this. First off, you can see the eutectic structure much more clearly. These are now not platy like these are. These are platy, they're more angular. These are growing in big globs. And this is now aluminum, so the protective phase has changed. So what does that mean? It must mean that when you doped it, even just a little bit, your phase diagram must have changed because we're still at the same composition. I mean, yeah, you technically doped it a tiny, tiny bit, but you're still right here, which means that your eutectic must be on the other side. And I'm asking you to calculate what is that new eutectic composition based off of the fraction of the phase there. So you're converting basically area fraction to weight fraction? Yeah. And I realized in my solution I actually forgot to convert from area fraction to weight fraction. It doesn't change it a lot. I did this with Alex earlier. It does change it a little bit. But yeah, that, that would be the right thing to do. Go from area fraction to weight fraction and then see, see where it is the new, the new point. Two big centimeters is directly proportional to two millimeters. Sorry, directly proportional to we're assuming that that's not the case if you have it's definitely the case if you have spherical grains but if you have long platy grains it depends on how they're oriented so it, it might not be okay. we're going to make that assumption we're going to assume in this class that area fraction is proportional to volume fraction it won't be if they're oriented funky and they're elo and they're elongated grains but we're going to assume that for now yeah you don't actually need that error, that scale bar at all if you load this up in image J, it's gonna be an image that you upload. The image will have like some number of pixels by some number of pixels, so you know the total number of pixels. Yeah. And what image J lets you do is 
lasso them, it will tell you how many pixels are inside the lassoed areas. Oh, so the then you'll have the fraction. That's it. Yeah, the fraction of pixels inside versus outside will give you the area fraction of the circled region if you've gone through and carefully circled these things. Image J. Yeah, so I've got a. You can just Google it. I don't know if I actually provided a link or not. <laughs> it's um, one of the most down. It came out of the Institute of Health, NIH. NIH is about half of the federal funding. When we fund research in this country, about half of it goes to the Institute of Health. And uh, this is something that came out of that. And it probably has 10 gazillion citations. Whoever made this super simple tool is like, it's wildly popular. Um, also, if you have trouble getting the threshold to work, if you ever do this again, uh, throw it through Photoshop and use Magic Wand. It helps a lot. That's also easier. But no, yeah, and you have access to that. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what the metrics are, but it's been used a ton. Somebody invented this tool. There's plenty of other ones if you want to use them. I just like ImageJ because it's lightweight and small and free. Yeah. Does doping like increase the diffusion of the free material? Does it like increase the diffusion of the free material? Like, we, we haven't talked enough about diffusion answer that question. Okay. So we have to uh, put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. Other questions. So we are at three quarters of our time is spent. Let's look at our study guide. Are, is there anything here we haven't talked about? Well, Gibbs is on the exam, so I'm going to hold off on that for this midterm review. Wait, if it's on the exam, shouldn't we? Oh, it's so easy. If it's not on the study guide, then it's not on the exam. Oh. Now, is, are we going to test you on it? You betcha, but not on midterm one. It'll be on the final exam for sure. There's some things like, look, I only have three questions. You only have 50 minutes on the exam. I have to pick and choose which babies to, to test you on, and that just didn't make the cut this time. But I get the final exam. And you can bet you if I didn't cover something as big as Gibbs Energy, which we had a whole homework on, then it's going to show up on the final exam. Six questions uh, <laughs> instead of three. Of we already did that. Let's see if there's anything else we haven't covered yet. Yeah. Um, how do we know if something has solid and solubility on phase Good question. Let's, let's look up a new phase diagram. These are all unaries. That's not what we want. It's funny that there's so many unaries. How about this one, though? So this is a phase diagram between aluminum and magnesium. You guys tell me, are there any regions on this diagram where you see solid solubility? Where are they? Alpha. At low temperatures, very little. You can't dissolve very much magnesium into aluminum at low temperatures. If you heat it up, it can take all the way up to this is a weight percent. It can accommodate. I don't know, 17 or 18 weight percent of magnesium. It's a lot. It becomes really soluble at that, that point right there. Yeah, we're in the What does a solid solubility mean? Solid solubility means in a single phase, you can have a range of different compositions because it, you can dissolve one into another. Right? For example, this is a single phase, pure aluminum. We can dissolve a little bit of magnesium into it, and this line tells us how much we can dissolve into the central temperature. Same thing with this side, pure magnesium. You can dissolve a little bit of aluminum into it. Kind of similar, it's kind of symmetrical looking. There's similar solubilities in these two things. Where else do we see it? Um, two other spots. Y. y. Yeah, gamma. Gamma has, this is the spinel structure. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's not on side. Uh, but you have this big region here in the middle where you have solid solubility. It's a single phase, and at low temperatures, it's a line compound. It only exists at a super specific chemistry. But if you heat this thing up, all of a sudden it can accommodate multiple different compositions. Solid solubility. Yeah? Does like AL3 MD2 not have solid solubility? Is it just straight up and down? AL3 MD2, if you think it's a line compound, but it's not. It doesn't allow any excess aluminum, but it does allow excess magnesium on this side. So it, it, it looks like a line compound, it's not solid. It has, it is straight on this side, but it does allow a little bit of excess magnesium. Okay. Whereas this R compound, whatever that is, is a straight up line compound. There is no temperature at which it has solid solubility. This guy has pretty constant solid solubility until it tapers off up here. But it's not very much, it's only a couple. Of <laughs> Why does this matter? If you're trying to make a compound with a line compound, let's say I'm trying to mix this up in the lab and I want to make compound R. 
and it's got to be completely baked pure on 100% error. That's hard to make because you got to like hit it right on the head. And if you wait things out, or something volatilizes in the furnace and you block one of the components, which happens all the time, especially with volatile light elements like lithium or sodium, which float off in the furnace, then even though you came to this composition, you're actually here, you can see like a little, you go to two different places. Um, it's just a bummer. You have to remake it, adding a little bit of excess, whatever this component was, because you know that some of it's going to volatilize off and you're trying to hit it. It's just hard. Um, whereas if it's a component like this, you're going to hit it because it's a big target. It's easy to hit that thing. It may not have the composition you want, so you might still have to mess with it. But in terms of getting the right phase, it's a big target. Yeah? Are we going to go with energy support pumps? Or? We already did that. That was the key to both phase steel and line production. Yeah. Does that have any questions over actually about yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Okay, any other questions you see on here that you're not satisfied with? You want to see more on? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's label this guy. If we didn't, if it wasn't labeled, let's see how we would go about it. So I'm going to just screen capture this one. If we were assigned to label this thing, how would we do? Bad. No, confidence. We're going to do great. If none of these labels were here, we would start at the top. Liquid, and you can see the liquid super obviously in these diagrams. It's always a single phase region, which means that entire region is all single phase. So starting at the top, just start drawing some lines. Let's do one at 600 degrees. That means we're in that single phase in the middle. That means this has to be a two phase region. This has to be a two phase region. That means this region next to it has to be a single phase. That has to be a single phase. The wall members are always single phase. So done. What's great about that is because we identified that this region is a single phase, it is all the way down. This whole thing is a single phase. Same thing over here. This whole thing is a single phase, which we're going to use now when we draw another temperature. If we drew another temperature on here, right there, this is still single phase. That, sorry, that sap thing is so weird. Those end members are still single phase. So we think that this is a two phase region. We think that's a single phase in the middle, that little guy, which makes this a two phase, one phase, two phase, one phase. If you were uncertain, because there's a, we, we had some assumptions, especially with this straight line, like maybe you felt like this looks like a line compound to me. If you were uncertain, just draw the line a little bit higher up. If I draw it right here, just below this eccentric, but just above that one, just above that one, you notice a single phase, two phases have to be a single phase. This has to be a two phase. If we know that's a two phase, that means that that region here, thin as it is, has to be a, a single phase region, not a line compound. Right? So, working your way down, if, you, if there's ever ambiguity, go up a step, see what you missed, and then work your way down and take over. How about this weird R guy? How would we check that? If we already did our pink line, let's do one for blue. We know that's one. We decided this was two already. We already decided that's one. Over here, this is one. We already know that's a two. We decided that is a one region. So our assumption is two, and coming from the other side, that's two. Therefore, this has to be a line compound. It's got to be one, two, one, two. So that has to be a line compound. Yep. Yeah. That's labeling these. Other questions? Yeah. How do you know if you're going from a liquid to a liquid plus a solid? So the liquids are always at the very top of the diagram, and next to it, you're always going to have a liquid plus solids or liquid plus liquid. Um, you can have immiscible liquids. Let's show you what that looks like. Um, so an immiscible liquid phase diagram will look like you'll have a monotectic, I think is what we call those points. Like, where's one? Um, that's not what I'm looking for. This, oh, this, there's one. All right, here's an example where the liquid is clear, the clear top of the diagram, but then you have this region where you have, this is clearly like this white region. That white region up there is also liquid. Anytime you have a phase diagram with a phase diagram drawn, the things on the left and, and the right dictate what's in the middle. In this case, it's liquid on the left and the right. Therefore, in that orange region, it's two different liquids. It's two different compositions. It's like oil and water, right? 
Well and water do not mix, right? They, they phase separate in two different compositions. One is water and one is oil composition. That's what that miscibility gap is showing in the photo. If you look at the other one that I saw, I mentioned like right here, let's say this is a liquid here. Oh, this is, this is showing vapor, so this is going really high temperature. Okay, so here's the miscibility gap for liquids that we saw right there in orange. We're showing one like that here. And then this is now at a high enough temperature at the liquid phase that doesn't phase separate all the way across as a mixture on whatever your compounds are. But you might have a single boiling point at the lowest boiling point, boiling point yeah, turning into a vapor. But you can also have now liquid and vapor shown here. Now, I've never come up with vapor in any of my phase diagrams class because we usually are trained about condensed matter. But technically, on all the phase diagrams we've shown, shown, if you go hot enough, you would have a vapor phase up there and some sort of equilibrium also has to exist. Meaning a liquid plus a vapor, two phase region that they exist with one another. Yeah. Do you know it's two separate liquids because of how the orange lava was it touched? Is there any metal or anything or something? Like what is that? In, in any region, you look to the left and the right. So when I look at this, like if there's a region on a phase diagram, the stuff that's in this is whatever you see on the Over here is the liquid, over here is the, the two different compositions of liquid. Okay, yeah, three different yeah. Yeah. That, that's what it's labeled on one and two uh, to denote that they're different compositions, even though they're both in liquid state. It looks like the same liquid, just kind of over the whole thing. Like. And you can get the same thing happening with solids. It's called spinodal decomposition. And it does the exact same thing, but in a solid phase. So if you look at the phase diagram, where's a good diagram that shows it? These are all terrible. Um... Right here. So this is showing you, it's not even showing you liquid. It doesn't go high enough to show you. But it, as you combine iron and chrome, way up there is liquid. We didn't see liquid on this diagram. Here you've got, this is BCC. That's a, a type of crystal structure of uh, iron. And clear over there, you've got chrome. And in the middle, you have two different salts. You have BCC, BCC there. Up here, again, you have two different salts. This diagram has an intermediate compound in the middle of them. Everything it's always telling you is on the left and right, that's made of. Again, on the left is PCC A2, whatever that is. Here is the constant sigma. In the middle, whatever those two left and right things are. Over here, same thing. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, there's none on the midterm, uh, so I'm not going to cover it in this midterm review session. What type, as you can say, any, I'll never test you on something you didn't get a chance to see on a homework, that type of question on a homework. So if you want to know what type they'll look like, they'll look like the homework. But um, they're not on this midterm. Can you go back to the list of topics? Yeah. Is there anything that we just haven't talked about so far? Because I know we've done... Like, you tell me. I think, I think we've covered everything. Yeah, let's do another one. Let's do a, a nasty phase diagram. What happens if I type in hard phase diagram? What happens? So whatever this guy is. So this is between aluminum and copper. So we already did the first one. We did the theta phase, actually the first one we did. What about, man, what is going on over there? So first off, anytime you see dashed lines, that's telling you that kinetically, it, either they don't know, they're guessing, or kinetically it's easily suppressed. So I don't know what that means in this system, but um, let's label this one. This is a good hard one. Let's label it first and then do an intermediate compound calculation. And then my battery's gonna die. So we'll do that much and then it's chalk talk at that time. Homework is still due in five and a half hours. Okay, so again, how do we know which ones of those are Line compounds or one or two phase regions, they haven't labeled them. The only one they've labeled is the theta phase. Probably because this is like a, this is a useful, interesting part of the diagram. They make aluminum alloys with copper, but they don't make copper with aluminum. Like these things are probably not good for much, and so they're not labeled. But certainly there's some line compounds there. Again, our assumption is anytime you see a straight line, it's probably a line compound. So let's go ahead and label it. I don't know what to do with these dashed lines. I'm just going to ignore the dashed lines for now. I think that that's showing you a kinetically limited thing. So we're gonna start by picking a straight line. Let's do this, just this gray line there. 
Up here, we knew this is a single phase. This little thin guy was two. Therefore, this whole region here is a single phase. All the way down, this is all single phase. Yep, that's what that means. So if that's single phase, this should be a two phase region if we were to zoom in on that, which means this is a single phase. We call that, because it's melting at a single point, congruent melting phase. That's a congruently melting single phase. We know this is single phase, that's two phase. This little sliver must be a one. This whole thing must be a two. That must be a single phase region. Um, something's not adding up though. If it didn't add up, then we missed a line compound. So that means this line right here must be a single phase. That's a two phase region. See how it works? Like if it ever is a number next to a number, you missed a line compound somewhere. If you're unsure, then go up and check again. Like let's check up on this gray, this, uh, gray line right there. One, that means this is a two. We think this is a one. Um, that makes this a two. That makes this a one, two, and one. Yeah, it works. So we keep on working our way down. Let's go to the next one down. Let's go down to like here. So that's a single phase, single phase, two phase, single phase, two phase. Uh, we decided that was a line compound. So I have to call that a single phase right there on the line, which makes that a two, single, two, one. Right, and on down we go. So let's figure out the composition of this big congruent melting phase up here. Like what is this phase? What's the formula of that phase? Okay, the way that we would do that is you look at where it is on the phase diagram. If it's given in mole percent, it's easy. It's not, it's given in weight percent. So we have to do a conversion. If it's in mole percent, it, that conversion's done for you. Since it's not, this guy to me looks like it's happening at, this gray thick mark is 90. Just to the left of that, 87. Call it that. So 87 weight percent copper. Let's do the math on it. If it's 87 weight, oh dear, weight uh, percent copper, then that means it's 13 weight percent aluminum. Therefore, if you had 87 grams of copper, we divide that by its molecular weight, 63.55 grams per mole. We'll do the same thing with aluminum, 13 grams of aluminum. We're gonna divide that by 26.98, it's uh, molecular weight, grams per mole. Somebody do the math on these with me. So 87 divided by 63.55. 87 divided by 63.55 is 1.369. That one is 13 divided by 26.98 is 0.481. Okay, this is a harder one. What is it? It might be a three to one. Let's do. Let's divide one by the other. What's 1.369? 1.369 divided by that whole thing. 2.8, so it might be a three to one. Remember, this is a compound that has solid solubility, so it has a range of formula that's allowed for it. We might not have picked it right at the right spot, so maybe it's like a one to three compound. Like maybe this thing is uh, aluminum, copper, three, maybe? Let's see if we can find one labeled and see what they found it to be. Aluminum, copper, phase diagram. Um, See if we find one where it's labeled that beta phase. Do they show the formula of the beta phase? Does somebody show it? Um, let's type in beta aluminum copper. Alanine, that's not it. Um, well, we picked a hard one because I don't know where to find to double check ourselves. Let's see if it was labeled on any of these other ones. Oh, right here. Okay. Here it is. It is, yeah, it's three to one. Three to one. So we did it right. Makes sense how we did that step? So some of these are harder, like look at this other one, like copper nine, aluminum four, that's gonna be a weird ratio. That would be a hard one to figure out. I wouldn't give you that one. That would be a hard one to, to trial and error, guess what the ratio should be. 
Yeah. Did you ever have a draw G versus T and U versus T graphs? Yeah, I don't think that's on the exam. That's not. That's not on the exam, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, it's not listed on the study guide, so it's not on the exam. This is the exam, right there. Yeah? Could you give just a quick rundown of all the constants we're going to need to have on our cheat sheet? Uh, I, at, my, at your own peril, like I'm, I may not remember them all, but for sure I would put the charge of an electron, Planck's constant, uh, permittivity of free space, speed of light, Gas constant, Faraday's constant. <laughs> you need, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on with my mouse? Let's try that one time. We built a cabin for my buddy in Alaska. He bought 40 acres of land, and he's like, hey, come up for two weeks and help me build a house. We cut the trees down, milled them to the shape, and built a bunch of my buddies from high school. It was like the coolest thing I've done in my life. It was a dream. <laughs> we, we built the cabin with a bunch of not dried wood, so it is warping for sure. <laughs> that is not a straight cabin, but it was, <laughs> it was a good time. Try that one more time. All right, the constants I think you should have are charge of an electron, Planck's constant, speed of light, um, permittivity of free space, Faraday's constant, gas constant. Um, I'm forgetting. Pi, I guess. And pi. Um, <laughs> Is that everything? Fair, uh, no, we got that. Got it. That's E. At your own risk, I think that's everything. Double check in on the homeworks that you've done on these topics, and if we missed something, include it. But I think that's all of them. All right, my battery's going to die. I'm going to close the recording before it does so I don't lose this recording.